I have nothing witty to say. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Die Hard MMA Podcast. I'm your host as always, Clint McClain. And this week we are headed back to Mother Russia. The USC returns to Moscow. And we've got a full card from UFC 244 with crazy stuff and bets on every single fight. To recap, let's get on into it. I would like to start by shouting out our new followers. We have failed at Life666. We have Sheila Shepard who joined the Die Hards. We have the Phantom. We have Adam Garbox. And then we have Cream on Her. Yes, that's correct. You heard that right. Cream on Her is now a subscriber on YouTube. Thank you for joining the diehards, everybody. So last week, we gave ourselves the challenge of betting every single fight on the card. Because it was such a gigantic and awesome card, it just was something fun that I had to do, and uh, I think it went pretty well. (laughs) Could have got a whole lot worse. I thought we were going to have a massive cash, though, with the way that we started, and then it trailed off at the end. It was a highly disappointing finish to the night, both betting and because of what happened in the main event. So here's your spoiler alert. If you haven't watched UFC 244, stop the podcast now, go watch UFC 244, and then come pick up at about the minute and 50 second mark. (laughs) So we kicked our night off with Hakeem Dwadu absolutely dominating Julio Arce, Great spot, great price, started the night off right. Our second bet of the night, we had Chance Rencounter, who decided he did not want to follow Coach Clint's game plan. I told the boy to wrestle, and he had no interest in grappling against Lyman Good. Now, this is one of those things. Maybe he felt Lyman Good, and he was simply too strong. Maybe he felt his power, and he wasn't strong enough to physically take him down. Um, And those are the types of things that only the fighter knows, only the coaches know after they get done with the fight. So we don't really know. Maybe he thought he had a striking advantage and wanted to test that out. And if that's the case, then I'm a little pissed because that was just a bad game plan. Anyway, he gets TKO'd in round three and basically got worked the entire fight. If you were on Lyman Good, congratulations. You were definitely on the right side of that one. And uh, if Ring Counter had done more of a grappling heavy type game plan, I feel like we had a shot. But in hindsight, it doesn't look like it was all that great. We absolutely slaughtered Chukagian by decision. Jennifer Mayo was completely outclassed. We called that one to a T and we got a better price by taking her by decision because that's the only way that Caitlin Chukagian wins. Caitlin Chukagian money line should always be the same thing as Caitlin Chukagian by decision because she will never submit anybody and she doesn't hit hard enough to knock anybody out. So there's no difference between the two. You might as well just take the by decision prop unless they give her an absolute cupcake that has a broken nose going into the fight. Then she might be able to get a TKO. (laughs) So after that, the night got very interesting. Jarzinho Rosenstruck steps in and bombs on Andre Arlovsky. Beautiful fadeaway hook that put Arlovsky down and man... I mean, it's one of those knockouts that we talked about how Andre Arlovsky back in the day, we thought he had some chin issues, and that seems to have kind of disappeared in his last couple fights. That's the kind of punch that makes you question his chin, but more so, I would say that makes you question just how much power does Rosenstruck pack. Man, Arlovsky didn't even get a chance to try to wrestle this dude before he was out flat on the canvas. Beautiful shot. Loved being on the right side of that one. And the same thing the next fight. Shabazian murked Tavares. Holy crap. I thought this was going to be a fight where the young kid got tested, where he got pushed a little bit. Maybe a second round knockout. Maybe something late in the third when he decided to pour it on and prove that he belonged at the upper echelon. But no. Round one, outclass Tavares from the first bell and put him down. Shabazian is going to be a problem. Also, um, on that last fight, Rosenstruck is filling in against um, Andre Arlovsky since Walt Harris pulled out of that fight, and I am super, super stoked for that fight. That's going to be a fantastic fight, and I'm looking forward to breaking that one down in a couple weeks. Also, thoughts and prayers go out to Walt Harris. 
and his family, they're still missing his daughter. I don't know if y'all have seen that on Twitter, but um, I feel for them. That's something that's uh, actually getting to the point of being scary. And I can't imagine trying to keep a professional fighting career on the track while all that's going on. So I'm glad he pulled out because the last thing he needed at this point is to be in front of his family and get knocked out by Alistar over him because he was unprepared and didn't have, you know, the the emotion or the energy to put into this fight camp like he normally would have. So good call on his part. Really hoping they find his daughter. Um, but really happy to see the matchup between Rosenstruck and um, Overeem. That's going to be fun. So next fight of the night was the first leg of our parlay. Shane Burgos, Makwan Americani. I told you all in the podcast, I don't like Americani. I think he's a dick. And I also, uh, I mean, I respect his skill set. Dude's got a good grappling game. His striking is coming along. He's wicked dangerous on the ground. But Shane Burgos handled him. I mean, he got into a little bit of trouble in round one. I was sitting on the edge of my seat, kind of clenching my butthole just a little bit because he was in some serious trouble as soon as it hit the mat. But uh, after round one, Americani was completely out of gas. And as soon as he slowed down from, he, you know what, on the third big heft where he was really trying to get Burgos to the mat, I went, that's all he's got. I mean, live in the fight, I was like, it's over. Round one, he made that third attempt at the takedown. I went, He's done because that was all the gas he had. He knew he needed to get the fight to the mat and he couldn't. And in round two, Mirakani is not the same thing as round one, Mirakani. Shane Burgos stepped on the gas and I was happy to see him win by TKO. We didn't end up taking him by TKO, unfortunately. I knew it was a possibility, uh, but I didn't know if he was actually going to get it done if Mirakani didn't gas himself out as hard as he did. So... That's why we went with the parlay and unfortunately that bit us in the ass a little bit, but we'll get to that in a minute. The next Walker, uh, sorry, the next fight, huh, Johnny Walker takes on Corey Anderson. And in my opinion, the biggest upset on the damn card, Corey Anderson came out of nowhere. Now I know the guy's got crisp boxing. I said that in the breakdown, but who knew he threw heat the way that he did? I mean, that's what an angry, motivated athlete can do. I completely counted out Corey Anderson in that fight. I'll be honest, I did. I thought it was takedown or bust. And unless he gassed Walker out with the wrestling, I thought he had no chance standing with Walker. And props to him and his team for highlighting that fault in Walker's game. He ate those right hands over and over and over again, and Corey put everything into them because he knew Walker just didn't have an answer for it. And, you know, I sit here and I watch these guys fight. I watch them fight live. I study tape before every single fight. I take notes. I let you know what they're all good at, what they're all bad at. And I had no idea that Johnny Walker could not defend against an overhand right. I had no clue. And as soon as Corey did it, and then on the, uh, you know, after fight interview, he goes, he can't take a right hand. I was like, oh, shit, you're right. He can't. <laughs> I mean, just props to him for finding that hole in his opponent's game. Good, good work for Corey Anderson. Absolutely, absolutely murked our parlay, though. I'm very upset about that. I was so high on that parlay. I thought that was... Uh, okay, I'll stop crying now. Parlay Busto, unfortunately, after the great call on uh, Burgos, got that one completely wrong to ruin it. Now, I think my favorite bet on the entire card was getting the main event started. The Motown phenom Kevin Lee. Y'all disrespected my boy Lee, and I told everybody from the get-go. I even tweeted it out that he was being disrespected and overlooked in this spot. I can't tell you how many people were all over Gillespie, and rumor has it he still hasn't gotten off the canvas. Kevin Lee absolutely knocked him dead with a head kick highlight reel knockout. We will not see a plus 140 on Kevin Lee's name again. He is a top-tier talent, Moving up to TriStar was the best thing he could have ever done, and now that he's gotten his mind right with a head coach behind the wheel, he's going to be a beast. He's going to be a monster, and I just see great things for Kevin Lee in the future, especially if he's fighting those fringe top 10, top 15 type of guys like Gillespie. He's going to do very well very well. Uh, Black Beast gets it done against Blagoy Ivanov. That was a great fight to watch. I can't believe Ivanov's chin. I mean, 
I'm happy Derek got the decision, and I think he handily won that fight. Honestly, it's funny. He said that he thought he lost the fight, which I don't know what he was looking at. But, I mean, I have no idea how Blagoy made it to the final belt. The shots that he took from Lewis were something else. Lewis on a diet program is a complete monster. He looks so much better. He dropped some weight. He's leaner. He's got better gas. And even, it's so funny, he powers out of submissions. I love it. You can't sub this guy unless you can get a rear naked choke on him. And apparently you've got to be Daniel Cormier to pull that off. Blagoy had him in a really, really deep and wicked shoulder lock. And Lewis just gave the thumbs up. I mean, apparently the dude's got, you know, really flexible shoulders on top of how big and strong he is. And then, kind of like I said in my breakdown, he pushed a 250-pound man off of him with one arm and was like, nope, get off. I mean, he just picks when he wants to stand up. It's almost like when his opponents are trying to submit him, he uses that time for rest. <laughs> I love the Black Beast. He's limited. He's a lot like my Roxanne Matafiri. I know his skill set. I know it very well. There are certain matchups where he's going to look great against, and I think because of the way he fights and because of his limitations, we'll get good prices from the bookie on him. So he's one of my favorite fighters to bet. Um, the next fight, this is where everything went off the rails for us. We were set for a massive, massive cash. We were 6-2 and two at this point in the night, and... I really thought we were going to roll into a giant score. Unfortunately, Luke just couldn't find the button on Steven Wonderboy Thompson. That was a war, man. These two went at it. And I'm starting to think that Luke may have done irreparable damage. He's very young. He's been in a lot of serious back and forth fights. And he's taken a lot of punishment. That's the kind of 15 rounder that um, after the previous war 15 rounders that he's been in, he's going to eat time off of his career he's also not improving that's something that um i'm finding very troublesome is that luke is that age that you would think he's got all the tools he's got all the gifts he's insanely durable he hits hard and he should be getting better with every single fight but i'm not seeing the evolution of luke that i'm expecting um especially fight to fight you would you would expect a young kid like him to be improving drastically and rapidly but he just got completely shut down by thompson and he landed some big shots a couple times. Thompson, you know, props to him. I thought that his chin was going to be cracked, and that was one of the biggest reasons we made the play that we did is I thought that of the two, Thompson's durability would be the one in question, but he still got it, man. He was able to walk through everything that Luke threw at him. So, you know, it's one of those things. I guess if you've got the speed advantage, that's when you can KO Thompson, but if you don't have that speed advantage... He's probably just going to outwork you. I'm a fan of Wonder Boy, so I'm happy to see him get back on track. The co-main event. This is one I'm very frustrated with. I've got a little bit of a problem with. So, when we got this thing started... Now, I'm not going to bitch and moan too much about this, because the whole thing was I wanted to do the challenge of betting every single fight. That's well documented. I would have passed on this fight if... If we weren't doing the every fight challenge, this is definitely one that I would have passed on. And I very incorrectly handicapped this fight, and I'll tell you why. Both of these guys, Kelvin Gastelum is coming off of a absolute war, a 25-minute war with Israel Adesanya, who we saw the kind of heat that that guy can bring when he took the title from Bobby Knuckles. He basically went out three times in that fight. I mean, he didn't actually get knocked out, but he damn near went out and shook the cobwebs off to stay in that fight, dug deep to stick around in it. That's an, that's the type of fight and the type of war that takes miles off of you. Same thing with Darren Till. He's coming off of two back-to-back -back finishes after being the hottest prospect the UK has ever seen. He doesn't want to do that again. Both of these guys were desperate for a win. And I missed it. I absolutely missed it. This is my fault. This is my bad. When two people are in that exact same situation, they're playing prevent defense in football. They just don't want to give the long bomb touchdown up. They're not fighting to win. They're fighting not to lose. And when you make that switch, the whole fight plays out differently. Kelvin Gastelum who's not a great wrestler, who's never shown anything but great counter-wrestling, he's never had a good offensive wrestling, especially not at 185 where he's a smaller guy, came out looking for the takedown. That's not something that we're ever going to expect to see out of Kelvin Gastelum. Darren Till, who's supposed to be this big giant beast of a man at 185 and a ridiculous power puncher, kept at the very end of his jab. 
and just tried to work on the outside and leg kick Kelvin Gastelum, the shorter fighter, and stay completely away from him. He wanted nothing to do with the heat that Kelvin might have been able to bring. He was looking to score exactly what happened, a three-round safe decision, and he wanted to pin him up against the fence and just grind the clock off. Neither of these guys were looking for the finish, and that was a lot of what I handicapped. That was a lot of what I looked into is that they were both going to look for the kill. And I think Kelvin's speed was going to get it done against Darren's damaged chin. And it just played out completely backwards from what I expected. And it was, it was rather eye opening. That's something I need to look at and pay attention to in the future. And something I wanted to pass on to you all, because that's something we need to keep our eyes open for as a team. When you've got two guys coming off of those kind of wars, those kind of knockout losses, unless your name is Nico Price Expect them to regress. Expect them to play it safe. Expect them to turtle up, get the win, before they get back on track being violent. Just something to keep in mind for all of us. So unfortunately, we dropped 1.9 units because we laid the wood on Kelvin Gastelum straight there. And that's another thing that I kind of regret because, again, like I said, I would not have played this fight if we weren't doing the whole bet every single fight thing. And I tried to play it safe. And playing it safe gets you hurt. I always talk to you guys about don't lay big prices. You just don't do it in MMA. It doesn't make sense. This is a perfect example. I laid a big price with Kelvin Gastelum, and this was a very, very close back and forth fight. All the value was on Darren Till based on the way the fight played out. He's the younger fighter. He's moving up a weight class. I mean, it would have been easy to risk one unit on the dog in this situation rather than laying two to one on a favorite who, in hindsight, we should have been unsure about. So, my bad, everybody. I apologize. That ate up a lot of our profit for the night, if you did tail me on every single bet. Um, and then the main event. You know, we were on the wrong side. I'll say it right now. Um, this is another one that I said I wouldn't be betting this if it wasn't for the every single fight challenge. Um, I thought it was an even fight, and I thought we were getting line value on Diaz at plus 155. We meet, we beat a massive line move. I mean, Diaz closed like plus 105. So we can take some solace in the fact that we beat a giant line move. But Masvidal was clearing away the better fighter there. And we just saw that total domination, total destruction over the first three rounds of the fight. And, you know, a lot of our handicap on Nate Diaz having a shot was being live because of his gas tank in rounds four and five. Now, after the fact, total hindsight, Nate said he was having some injury issues that he was trying to conserve himself for the later rounds. I don't know how true that is. I don't know how much stock we can put into it. It makes me feel a little bit better as a Nate backer saying, you know what, if he was planning on turning it up in rounds four and five, kind of a la Max Holloway style, um, that was exactly what we wanted. So... We were on the right path, maybe, um, watching the fight. I don't know if it would have mattered. I don't know if he had enough pop on his punches to get Masvidal's respect, even though he landed some big shots and some decent combos. He just didn't seem to be hurting, George. Um, it was it was a good fight up until the point that it got stopped. I really wish it had continued, because you all have seen the memes on Twitter and stuff, I'm sure. It was not that bad of a cut. And a guy like Nate will fight through that kind of a cut for another 10 minutes. Now, George probably would have kept targeting that side of his face and maybe it would have gotten worse and then just been stopped in round four or something like that. That's entirely possible, but it feels bad, man. It feels bad to bet on a guy thinking we need rounds three, four, and five, and then the fight gets cut off by the doctor in round three. I mean, that just chopped our legs off. We had no shot at winning the fight because of that. So is what it is. We end up going seven and five on the night. So, you know, more positive than negative. And we went plus three, I'm sorry, plus 0 0.63 units. So we made a slight bit more profit than what we lost last week on the Bellator fights. So all in all, I'm happy with it. It was an excellent night of fights. It was a fun night of fights. As far as an entertainment standpoint is concerned, uh, you couldn't ask for a better night. It started off with a barn burner and it was all finishes and knockouts and fantastic fights all the way up the board. I mean, it's hard to ask for anything more than that. And on top of the fact, we didn't lose any money doing something very stupid. <laughs> that's that's a pretty damn solid night. So thank you all for riding along with me. I hope if you tailed, you uh, you know broke even or profited ever so slightly, kind of like I did. And uh, we can move right on into Moscow. 
So as far as the breakdown for UFC Moscow goes, I'm going to be honest with you all. I am going to go a little bit quickly here. I haven't had the amount of time to study these fights like I would like to. There are some that we are going to skip over and have very short breakdowns on, and I'm going to pass on a decent chunk of these fights, both because from a betting perspective, I don't find a lot of spots so far that I like this week, and also because I need more time to do so. I took my four-year-old daughter to Disneyland for her birthday this past week, so I am running short on fight recording time. I haven't had uh, uh, as much time to sit in front of my computer as I normally do to watch these fights. And especially when we go to Russia, these guys are all grapplers. You get lots of 15 and 25 minute decisions. (laughs) And that makes it real tough to study tape because I got to sit through, you know, three or four 15 minute fights in a row for every single fighter on the card. They take a whole lot more time than some of the other ones where you've got quick finishers and stuff like that. So let's get right on into it. You know, the way I think about UFC Moscow, it's the cigarette after the visual orgasm that was UFC 244. We're coming down off of that high and we're trying to keep it going for just a little bit longer. So we're going to take a drag on UFC Moscow before we get into some serious action over the next couple of fights. We've got some big, good, juicy stuff coming up, but this is a card that's going to be a lot of grinding. It's got some good spots, it's got some good fights in it, but in Russia, they rely heavily on wrestling. A lot of these guys, that's what they do, so brace yourself. If you're not into wrestling, if you're not into 15-round decisions, this may not be the card for you. I think there's going to be a lot more decisions on this one um, than most other cards you'd expect to see. That said, we're going to start the night out at Bantamweight, where Grigory Popov, 13-2, is taking on Davy Grant, who is 10-4. And And this is a very interesting way to start off the night. In fact, I actually think it might be one of the more fun fights on the card, so good way to get the night going. Um, Popov actually trains out of Russia. He's a very classic Muay Thai fighter. I mean, he's he reminds me a lot of Luk, uh, Lukbon Mi, the, the chick we cashed on a couple weeks ago. He starts out very slow, very plodding, very heavy-handed, heavy, heavy flat-footed, and then he loosens up as the fight gets going. He is a world Muay Thai champion prior to having transitioned over to MMA. He's 35 years old, and he does seem a little bit slow, especially at the beginning of fights. He doesn't have a whole lot of head movement, but damn does he throw heavy leg kicks. He hits really really hard with his legs. He works the body, he works the legs with his kicks very, very well. He fights while moving backwards and he switches stances, which I think gives his opponents a bit of trouble. And he does seem to have power in his right hand. One thing I noticed he likes to do is he does this awesome little uh, switch step in knee. He'll step in straight forward and then throw a knee right up into your midsection. It's kind of like a, I don't know, like an uppercut gut punch or something, except it's harder because it's with his knee. It's pretty freaking awesome. Now, he does have good balance and that's something to be you know, keep in mind something very important going up against Davy Dangerous Grant. He is a Ultimate Fighter 18 member, and he actually took three years off back in 2013 because he just kind of had constant injuries. I think they said it was a knee injury that was the biggest nagging thing, and he was out of the cage for a good three years. Um, he is a pressure fighter. He walks forward constantly, and he's a submission fighter. Eight of his 10 wins have come by submission. When it hits the mat, He scrambles very, very well. However, when it's on the feet, he's also kind of slow and plodding. And one of the things he does with his hands is he throws these really wide looping punches. He keeps his hands low and his chin is actually exposed when he throws those shots. His chin is also way exposed when he dives in for takedowns. He does exactly what your wrestling coach in MMA tells you not to do is he shoots with his face and his arms wide, which... I think he's going to leave him primed for a pop-off straight knee. Um, He has a good overhand right, and in his last fight, I'm sorry, not his last fight, uh, he fought Manny Bermudez before that in 2016. I know we're going back quite a ways, but he's been very inactive. He was fighting Damian Stasek, and he was up two rounds um, until he got caught in kind of a fluky submission armbar. I feel like he should have won that fight. He was mauling Stasek. Uh, Stasek until that point and then just got caught and then when he came in to fight Manny Bermudez he just looked old man Manny Bermudez floored him with a big punch and then while he was still rocked locked up the triangle choke and put him out this is one that I would caution you to kind of steer clear of I'm not high on either of these guys 
And as much as if you wanted me to make a pick, I guess I would go with Popov, but I also don't want to trust I don't want to trust Popov at this kind of a line. Um he's he opened up at minus 225, and most of the money, 71%, has come in on Davy Grant, um, pushing him down to about a minus 200, and it's held steady there. I don't think he should be that big of a favorite over anybody, and I'm damn sure not going to take a plus 170 on a guy like Davy Grant. He fought twice in 2016. He only fought once in 2018. He's coming off of a two-fight losing streak. He does look like he's in good shape, and he's taking it seriously, but he's 33 years old, and he's been plagued with injuries his entire career. He's the younger fighter. Gregory is supposed to be the old guy here, and he's coming off of a KO loss to Eddie Wineland, which he looked good. It was kind of a back-and-forth war, but Eddie Wineland is also a veteran of the sport, an older fighter. He's not somebody who you really want to be losing to, especially by KO at this point in your career. So on the feet, Popov's going to have a big striking advantage. If he can keep it on the feet, I think Davey's going to find himself out of water, and I expect... Gregory Popov's going to get the KO, but he's minus 200, so this is a clear pass. I'm not touching this one. Our next fight is in the UFC's lightweight division, where Alexander Yakovlev, 24, 8, and 1, takes on Roosevelt Roberts, who is 8, 1, and 0. Oh. Now, Yakovlev, you may recall, we broke down his fight against Alex De Silva um, back in April of 2019, and he won by submission in the second round. I'm actually a little bummed I didn't pull the trigger on that one. I felt like it was a good buy low spot on this guy, but there are so many questions around him that I didn't end up pulling the trigger. And I mean, the main thing was he was just so much damn bigger than Alex. Alex is a 145er who is jumping up on late notice to get his UFC call and taking on Yakovlev, who is a former 170 pounder that, man, I that was one of the big things is I was like huge size discrepancy. And that's really what made the difference. His size and strength wore Alex out. And that's really what opened up the choke at that point in the second round. Now he's coming in here against Roosevelt Roberts. And this is a bit of a different story. Roosevelt Roberts is eight and one. He's coming off of the first loss of his career, a Decision loss to Vince from Hell Pichel, which really isn't that bad of a loss. Um, and he's this kid is a potential rising star. He was just recently promoted to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Black, or sorry, Brown Belt. He already had a good ground game. The fact that he's a Brown Belt now is just even more impressive. He fights well, long. He's got straight long punches, and he works behind a really fast jab. He's really strong and powerful in the clinch. He has a good solid one-two, and his his two is really more of an overhand. Like he kind of changes the angle on the way he throws the two, and I think he lands with that thing very very well. He does have well-timed explosive knees. He has well-timed takedowns. He's damn well-rounded. I'm actually pretty high on Roosevelt Roberts. I think he's got a very, very bright future. Now, Yakovlev is a combat sambo and re and freestyle wrestling background. He is he's Skeletor, man. You should have seen this guy at 170. Go back and look for his fight against Kamaru Usman or Zach Cummings back in 2016. He looks like a completely different human being. When he cuts down to 155, he is so sucked out. It's, I don't know how he does it, and He's the kind of guy that they talk about having a 165 division four because he shouldn't be cutting as much weight as he does. He does have strong hips. He does have good submission defense, and he scrambles well to stay in top position when he's on the mat, but he does give up takedowns. That's something that I noticed is he does give up takedowns. Somebody like Alex, who is a big 145er, was not big and physically strong enough to actually take him down. I think the majority of this fight is going to get contested on the feet. If it does hit the mat, I think it's going to be a relatively even fight, but I think Roosevelt Roberts has a slight advantage, and like I said, one of the big things that I like about Roberts is his crisp, fast jab. I think if he works behind that for the course of this fight, he's going to have the better gas tank. He's going to be able to control the range of the fight, dictate the pace, and I think he's going to come out with a win. Yakovlev is 35 years old. He's fighting someone 10 years younger than him, and besides his last fight against an undersized fighter who should be a weight class down. He's riding a two-fight losing streak. Granted, that was to guys like Zach Cummings and Kamaru Usman, but that was three years ago. 
Generally, when we see fighters with this type of age discrepancy, the younger guy is the one that comes up, and I am impressed with a guy like Roosevelt Roberts. I think Alexander Yakovlev is the kind of guy who's really peaked as far as his skill set is concerned, and I think Roberts is the type of guy that's going to be improving beyond where he's at. I think he learned from his losses to Vince Pichel, but I don't like the line. I wish it was a little bit closer. I understand he's the favorite and people have been betting him, which is why he's becoming more of a favorite. Um, if buyback comes in on Yakovlev, if we can get Roberts down around the minus 130, minus 140 range, I would like to play him there. I don't know that that's actually going to happen. I doubt people are going to bet Yakovlev here, but I don't want to lay this kind of wood on Roberts. And I also don't feel comfortable putting him in a parlay. I thought about doing that, but really... I don't trust him enough and Yakovlev is dangerous enough that I don't want to link another fighter and another unit to the to that kind of a parlay. So if I can't play him straight, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to pass because I don't want to play him tied to anybody else. <laughs> I've got to apologize. I completely skipped over a fight. Uh, the second fight on the card is Jessica Rose Clark versus Pani Kianzad. And this fight is such a pass that I literally skipped over it doing the podcast. <laughs> I, in my head, I was like, yeah, I don't need to worry about this one, and I totally forgot to even talk about it. So Jessica Rose Clark is moving up, it looks like, from 125 up to 135 for this fight. She should be a decent bit healthier, a bit stronger, probably have a better gas tank, and that's good for her. But this is a rematch. These two have faced each other before back in Invicta, and Kianzad won that fight. Now, since then, um, Jessica Rose Clark has fought her way to the UFC, and she didn't look impressive on her way up. She <laughs> she was on a two-fight losing streak against Pam Sorensen, Sarah Kaufman, and then won a split decision over Karina Dam, and then got her call to the UFC. And then she beat Beck Rawlings, if that tells you anything, and then she beat Paige Van Zant. Like, what is that? <laughs> she is middle to low tier, and then she took those two girls out in the UFC. She got walloped by Jessica I, and then now is the time for the rematch, apparently, and Jessica Rose Clark is 31 years old at this point. Kianzad is 27 years old. She is 11 and 5. She made her UFC debut back in July, and she got beat by Juliana Avila. This fight is such a pass, I, I can't even get into how much of a pass it is. Neither of these girls is very good. I have been on five betting women's MMA lately. It has been my bread and butter outside of my girl Savage getting taken out by the future. We have been on an absolute tear betting women's MMA. So it makes me really sad that I don't have a position on this one, but this is going to be a sloppy low level back and forth fight. It's going to go to a split decision. You're not going to have any idea who's winning this thing. The judges aren't going to have any idea who's winning this thing. Do not put your money on this fight. Getting back on track, we're back up at Welterweight, where Abubakar Nurmagomedov, the cousin of Khabib. I'm sorry, I can say Nurmagomedov, but I can't say it after I spit out a name like Abubakar. <laughs> These Russians, man, I tell you. I can do some of the other accents and some of the other uh, names and things like that, but Russians, they just get me. These names are redonkulous. So he's taking on David Zawada. Now, Nermi is 15, 2, and 1, and David Zawada is 16, and 5. Habubakur is fighting out of Russia. Go figure. We talked about that already. And he's coming off of a split decision draw. I'm sorry, not a split decision draw. A unanimous draw to Bojan Vl uh, Velikovic. Now, you may recognize Bojan. He did have a run in the UFC. He did not do very well. And then he got dropped to the Pro Fight League where he, he won his debut and has since gone 0-4-1. Uh, <laughs> he is not a good fighter. You know how I talk about how in families, there's one who's good and then there's one who's meh. And it's like the Lozon brothers. There's Joe Lozon and then there's Dan Lozon. And you're like... Joe Lozon is the shit. Joe Lozon's awesome. Dan Lozon must be awesome. Well, this is like Khabib. Khabib's the 155-pound champion. His bigger, stronger, younger cousin must be a beast. I don't think he is. <laughs> I just don't think he is. Now, he's taking on David Zawada, who's essentially 
the UFC's most hated fighter. They can't stand this guy. And I say that because he stepped in for his UFC debut against Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts, who we'll talk about later on in the card, in 2018, and he dropped a split decision. As soon as they saw that, they went, stepping stone. <laughs> they sent this poor kid to take on Jing Ling Liang. I'm sorry, Jing Liang Li. Jeez, I'm doing it again. Every time that guy's name come up, I always say it wrong. I'm sorry. So, the leech, they sent him to China to fight the leech, and he got KO'd. <laughs> in round three against the leech which you should not be surprised by now they are sending him to russia to make khabib's little cousin look good that's what this fight is this is a setup this is a spot where the ufc wants khabib's boy to win he is an astounding minus 295 favorite he should not be that big of a favorite in my opinion over anybody but david zawada is exactly the type of fighter that you expect to see him be that kind of a favorite against. He's going to murk this dude. He's going to maul him. I mean, I don't know that he's going to finish him, but he's going to blanket him and win a very runaway decision. I don't feel comfortable betting uh, Abakar, and I I won't until I see something impressive from him over decent competition. So this is another steer clear fight. Our next fight is at middleweight where Roman Kopilov, who is 8-0 undefeated, is taking on Carl Robertson, who is 8-2-0. Now, Roman is 8-0 with 7 knockouts. He fights out of Russia, and he fights in Global Fight Nights Russia, which is actually a relatively respected division over there. And one thing that I like to see here is most of his KOs don't come in the first round. He's not the guy that's murking bad competition and then you'll expect the step up and not so good. No, he's dominating his opponents and then KOing them in the second or the third round later on in the fight. I think he is a definite prospect, somebody that we need to look out for. And I'll be honest with you, this is one of the fights that I have not had the the time to tape. So Carl Baby K Robertson, he's another guy that I'm extremely high on. Now, he lost to Glover Teixeira back in January 2019 but he fights at 185 and he jumped up to 205 on short notice and he gave Glover a hell of a round one before he got taken down and submitted. He got choked out by Cesar Ferreira, who's another Brazilian jiu-jitsu type of guy and besides that, he beat Jack Marshman and Wellington Terman. I mean, his level of competition in the UFC has been all over the place. But if you recall back on Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series, he's the dude that deaded Ryan Spann. And we know Ryan Superman Spann is the guy that's got heavy, heavy hands and he's very durable. This guy KO'd him in 15 seconds. So we're very high on Carl Robertson as well. This fight is going to be a banger and I need to research it more so we're gonna put a pin in this one I can't tell you a whole lot more about it because I really want to dig into the skill sets of these guys and like I said they take time I mean the last couple fights for uh Roman two four round like main event five rounder type of fights that went to the fourth round and then like I said most of his fights go to the second and the third so lots of time eaten up on that luckily um Carl Robertson will save me a little bit of time because he's got a couple of first round submission losses. So he's going to be a bit easier to research, but I really need to dig into the Russian before I can tell you anything. Some people who I respect, shout out to my boy Rocker Z. Um, They're on Carl Robertson already as a bet because he is the underdog in this spot. And anytime my boy Z or my boy Bro Picks, or my boy Kelton, when they're on anybody, I always take a double take at them. I look very, very close and hard, because I respect the opinion of those guys. You can't hear it, but I'm fist bumping you over the microphone here. And Robertson, you can get right now at even money. Minus 105, minus 110, plus 100 at Pinnacle. Um, The line looks like it's set to flip. He opened up at plus 120. 53% of the money has come in on Baby K. So... There's more than just my boys who are seeing something here. I need to look into it, and we will put a pin in it for later. Keep an eye out on my Twitter. Give me a follow, at DieHardMMAPod. I tweet out early lines when I like spots, and I think the line is going to move against us. I jump on those, and you can get that information right away if you follow me on Twitter. I like to retweet fight announcements and stuff like that so you can be caught up on everything and I personally think I'm funny. Now, I'm a dad, so I have bad, terrible dad jokes. You might not think I'm funny, but I think I'm funny. So go follow me on Twitter. (laughs) The next fight is another welterweight tilt where Rustam Habilav, who is 23-4, taking on Sergei Kanzoko, who is 26-5. 
five and one. Habilov is 33 years old versus Sergey, who is only 27. And Habilov trains out of Jackson Wink MMA. He's going to be the, uh, now I was going to say he's going to be the hometown Russian fighter, but actually both these guys, this is some Russia on Russia violence. The biggest thing that you need to know about Habilov is that he is an absolute grinder. That's all this dude does. He has 14 decision wins of his 23 wins. He's been in the UFC for quite some time now, and man, he's he's got some serious grind time here. Let's take a look at this. So he was unfortunate enough to run into Benson Henderson all the way back in 2014, lost a split decision to Adriano Martins in 2015. Since then, he has gone on a six-fight win streak all six by, I'm sorry, five of the six by unanimous decision. He did have a split versus K. John Johnson in 2018. Now, he got uh, he got blanketed by Carlos Diego Fajaya back in 2019. But again, we know all about Diego Fajaya and his grappling prowess. So when you take a grinder versus a guy like um, Damian Maya or Diego Fajaya, you're in trouble. It's a bad matchup. It's hard for you to do what you do against a guy like that. So he averages 2.1 significant strikes per minute, and he absorbs 2.2 significant strikes per minute. Um, he gets outlanded by his opponents ever so slightly, but he's got very low output. He does have a takedown average of 3.94 takedowns per 15 minutes. So he's landing roughly four takedowns for every 15 minute fight. He's got a 42% takedown accuracy, which is relatively high. And like I said, he's done it on, I'd say a decent level of competition, a mid tier level of competition in the UFC so far. Sergey has only been in the UFC for one fight. So we only have one fight to take a look at for him under the big lights. He's got a wealth of experience outside the UFC's octagon though, and he's very well-rounded. Like I said, he's 26 and 5, 10 KOs, 7 submissions, 8 decisions, very, very well rounded. He did go on a bit of a spurt there from 2015 to 2017 where he was kind of alternating wins and losses, but it looks like he's kind of right, uh, righted the ship. Now, he made his debut against Rostam Akman, who is 6 and 2, but his two UFC fights have both been losses, one of them against the debuting Sergey, so it's kind of just simply based on his level of competition. Kind of hard to see exactly where this guy's at. Now, in his one fight against Dachman, he averaged four significant strikes per minute, absorbing only 2.6. So he wildly outstruck uh, Rostam Achman. Now, he only had a 60% defense on his takedowns. He was taken down twice by Achman. And this, it's not a very good good assessment of the fight, but this is not a fight I'm overly interested in, to be completely honest. Um, I think Habilov is going to take him down and grind him out. He's sitting at about a minus 175 favorite right now. We don't know enough about Sergey at this point to really have any strong opinion of him whatsoever. He's only 27, so maybe he'll show improvements. Habilov is 33. You're not going to get anything new, different, or better from him, and he's training out of Jackson Winks, so you know they've got a good game plan. They're very smart in the way they do things. I would expect Habilov to grind out another win here over a guy like Sergey, but... I mean, don't count out the younger fighter. I don't feel comfortable taking either of them. This is unfortunately another pass. Now we got a fight. The main event of the prelims. We are moving up to the big boys. Light heavyweight where Magomed Ankalaev takes on Dalucha Lungiambula, who is known as champion. Talk about setting the bar high for yourself, dude. You might want to give yourself a bit of a different nickname. But so far... He's kept relatively true to his word. So Magomed Ankalaev is 11 and 1, whereas Dalucha Lungiambula, which that's a fun name to say, he's 10 and 1. So both of these guys have one loss. Both of their one losses have come by submission. Kind of crazy. Uh, Champions one loss came back in 2015, whereas Ankalaev's one loss came in 2018 versus my boy, the Bear Jew, Paul Craig, with about one second left on the clock. This is one of those fluky, crazy submissions that we love the guy for. This is one that he locked up and derailed the uh, undefeated fighter in his UFC debut type situations. Since then, he's put it back together. TKO'd Marcin uh, Prancino and has a win over Klitsen Abreu earlier this year in 2019. I'm relatively high on 
Magomed Ankalaev. I think this guy is something we need to keep an eye on. He's got a very good skill set for MMA. And if you just take a look at his record, like I said, he's 11 and 1. He's very much on the upside, in my opinion. Dude is 6 foot 3. He has a 75 inch reach. And over his three fights in the UFC, he averages 3.05 significant strikes per minute. He has only absorbed 1.33 significant strikes per minute. We've talked about that before. A lot of times, those giant strike differentials come from when they have their opponents on the mat. When they can hit their opponents and their opponent can't hit back, it makes a big difference in the striking game. This dude has some serious hellish ground and pound. When he gets you on your back and pounds away, it is something to be terrified of. In his fight with Klitz and Abreu, he busted that dude's nose. Now, he did that standing, but once it hit the mat, he just repeatedly started hammering on this poor guy's broken nose. He roughed Abreu up, and props to Abreu to, for making it the full three rounds in that fight, because most people would have gone belly up taking that kind of damage and repeatedly getting a broken nose smashed into their face. Hankalaev is light on the feet, he's sharp with his hands, for 205, he moves well for a big guy. Like I said, somebody who I'm very, very high on and looking forward to in the future. Now, champion on the other side of this thing is a brick shit house. This is one of those dudes that you do not want to meet in a back alley, and he looks like he belongs fighting inside of a cage. He has five of his wins by knockout. Surprisingly, only five of his wins by knockout with the way this dude looks. You'd think he had some serious power on his hands. He did win his UFC debut against Daquan Townsend via TKO. Now, Townsend is 19-8. and eight. He was making his UFC debut that night as well. Kind of a setup fight. Not really anything to be overly hyped or concerned about. And the majority of the competition that Champion has faced has been relatively low. So we still don't know a whole lot about him and how much he belongs at the UFC level. What we do know is he's a complete nerd. I love this guy. He's a Marvel geek. He is all about Wakanda. I mean, you he looks like he belongs as an extra in Black Panther. He really, he could have suited up and been the king of one of the other tribes from Black Panther. Um, I love that he embraces that. That's so awesome. They've, he's got a picture on his Instagram you should check out of him decked out in like tribal Black Panther style um, gear. And then he's sitting on the throne from Game of Thrones. It's kind of a cool cross nerd combo. <laughs> he's got an awesome uh judo background and he trains with serious high caliber wrestlers so even though he wasn't ever really that much of a wrestler himself you should see him grappling in the cage he is absolutely explosive he mixes up trip takedowns with explosive double legs and he has that lift you over the head and slam you type of body takedown when he fought his uh one and only ufc opponent daquan townsend he averaged 5.61 takedowns over the course of 15 minutes which i'm not really sure how that uh you know factors out because he only had one fight so it should be a round number but maybe i don't know maybe he got like a partial takedown credit or something like that for the trips i'm not sure how they got to 5.61 since he's only got one fight <laughs> it should be a round number it looks like he landed four clean takedowns based on the stats of the fight, and uh, he did get a couple of trips. He had got a couple of slams in there. He also has solid ground and pound. It looks like he blitzes with some big, heavy shots and then likes to get his opponent up against the cage. From there, he works and tries to get his opponents to the mat, and then he likes to hang out on top. He likes to float on top. He likes to ground and pound. He has been to the later rounds a decent number of times over his career on the lower regional scene he's got a great mix of action which is something that i do like to see to me you know it shows that he's been pushed in the right places um he had a five round 25 minute split decision prior to coming to the ufc for efc worldwide he got a second round and a first round ko then he got a unanimous five round decision prior to that he won via tko in the fourth round prior to that i mean so even though he's a big muscly dude he knows how to pace himself and he knows how to take fights deeper and this is something that my i'm having to scrape my jaw off of the floor right now delucha lungiambula is currently plus 310 you heard me right. He is plus 310 over at five dimes. And 
using my handy dandy tool here at bestfightodds.com. Go ahead and check that out. He opened up at plus 135. So the bookmakers are saying that Ankolaev is a favorite, but it's a relatively close fight. And it's been a landslide of money on Ankolaev that has driven this line all the way up to plus 310 on Lugiambula. And I got to tell you, from what I've seen, this guy shouldn't be a plus 310 underdog to anybody. He's got a solid grappling game. He's physically strong and powerful. Good takedown awareness himself. Heavy hands. Very fast. I mean, he's 34 years old, so he's making a bit of a late run into the UFC and into the you know MMA in general. But he's 10 and one, and he's looked impressive from what I've seen so far. Yes, I'm high on Magomed and Kolaev, but he hasn't fought the most experienced opponents either, and he's got a lot of early KO wins himself. I think this is going to be a bit of a banger, and if you're going to make this thing a bit of a banger, this dude's got a puncher's chance. And at plus 310, like I, this is one where I'm going to use a bit of a weird angle on this one. The bookie knows what they're doing. Now, in MMA, not always so much. They make a lot of mistakes in mixed martial arts, and that's why we have so much fun betting it. They don't always set things appropriately. But a lot of times, they know what they're talking about. And if the bookie watched these fights, and they think Ankalaev is just a little bit of a favorite over uh, Lugiambula, now the market has told them that they're wrong. But I would never play Magomed Ankalaev at this price. And I feel like I have to play Dalucha at this price because you talk about a puncher's chance at, you know, I like to take the dog at heavyweight fights and things like that. This dude can easily win by KO against anybody at 205. He's got that kind of power. If he turns in this into a brawl, if this turns into a scrambling wrestling type brawl and both these guys are slinging leather, either one of them could go down. Both of them have shown to be durable. Both of them have shown to hit hard. They both have wrestling chops. And I think Dalucha's got a serious speed advantage. I've got to take it. I'm going to risk a unit, and I'm going to roll with Dalucha champion. Let's go. Wakanda forever, baby. We're locking up that plus 310. We're sticking around the big boys at light heavyweight where Shamil Gamzatov, Gamzatov is taking on Klitsen Abreu. Uh, Shamil is 29 years old. Klitsen is 26 Shamil is 13 and 0 fighting out of Russia, and he comes from the Pro Fight League, where his back to back wins have been by unanimous decision. He's your classic Russian grinder. Klitsen Abreu is 15 and 3, hails from Brazil, and he's coming off of a nice win over Sam Alvey. Before that, he lost a decision to Magomed Ankalaev, which we discussed just a little bit earlier and he was on a decent run right before that i mean he was on a six fight win streak before he got his ufc call and lost to magomed and Kalev. so it's nice to see him right the ship now him winning to sam alvey in 2019 isn't something to write home about i will be honest i haven't done a whole lot of tape study on this one if i recall correctly actually i didn't think he was worth betting against Sam Alvey. I bet on Sam Alvey to bounce back against Klitz and Abreu, and uh, he ended up winning a unanimous decision, but I was not overly impressed with him in that fight either. So we now have a spot where a guy who, granted, this isn't super fresh in my memory because it was a little while ago. Like I said, I apologize. Haven't had a whole ton of time to look at some of these fights, but I've got a guy who I'm not super high on versus an undefeated Russian prospect you kind of know where that one's gonna go. I'm honestly surprised to see where the line is at this point because some of the other ones are way wider than I would expect them to be. Shamil opened up at minus 165 and this is a reverse line movement spot. 48% of the money has come in on him and he's been driven all the way up to minus 220. Klitsen Abreu is plus 175 or plus 180, somewhere in that ballpark. And surface level recap on this one, like I said, I'm just not impressed with Klitsen Abreu. And the kind of fighter, you know, a 13-0 and Russian who can knock you out, who can submit you, who can blanket you for 15 minutes. I mean, he kind of can win this fight however he wants to and uh, you can get him at the low low price of minus 200 I think Shamil wins this fight I'm not overly confident in that pick because like I said I haven't done a whole crap ton of research on it but I do think that he takes this one home and we move on
We're moving down the scales just a little bit to welterweight where Ramazan Amiv takes on Rocco Martin. Ramazan Amiv is 32 years old, 18 and 3. Our boy Rocco Martin is 29 years old. He is 16 and 5. And if you remember, we broke down Rocco Martin not too long ago when he fought Damian Maya in June of 2019. Now, Ramazan Amiv, the first thing I've got to say about this guy is he has no jaw. He is only chin. <laughs> Go look at this guy. He is Bigfoot Silva's estranged son. He has no jawline whatsoever. It's an oval until it gets to his chin, and then that thing looks like you shoved a brick in there. Have you ever seen the Emperor's New Groove? He looks like Kronk. <laughs> He's physically strong. He's got really great timing. He uses body lock takedowns, and he throws big heavy shots in the pocket. He does some good work when he pressures his opponents up against the cage, and he's really good in the clinch. He does have constant forward stalking pressure. He does a nice step in body shot that I'm really a fan of, and he does double up on the jab, which is another thing that I do like to see. However, he's a little bit low output compared to somebody like Anthony Rocco Martin. At least that's the way it looks from watching his fights. Now, Rocco Martin, he trains out of American Top Team, and it looks like he's been partnering that with Tiger Muay Thai. If you take a look at his Instagram, he has been all over training with current and new Bellator champion Douglas Lima, who we've seen reach absolutely massive heights very recently in his uh, his run through the Bellator tournament. So that's somebody you want in your corner. Um, he, he's an excellent counter-wrestler. You've seen in his last couple of fights here, let's read off these names to you, Jake Matthews, Sergio Marais, and Damian Maya. Now, he beat Jake Matthews up and then submitted him in the third round. Sergio Marais, he... Kind of the similar matchup of Damian Maya. He's been working on his counter jujitsu and counter wrestling because both of those guys want to chain grapple you, take you down, and submit you. He has been working on anti that basically for the last year. So beating somebody who I'm relatively high on, even though he's a young flawed fighter in Jake Matthews, um, it's an impressive win for him to get. And then surviving for three rounds, getting backpacked by Damian Maya, and not getting finished. That's actually relatively impressive as well, believe it or not. He had his moments in that fight where he looked like he posed a threat to Damian Maya. He uses butterfly hooks really well. He reverses position. He has sweeps. In fact, he almost swept Damian Maya when they hit the ground a couple of times, which, again, I know I'm saying almost, but against a guy like Damian Maya, that's actually really impressive, especially with what we've seen from Damian Maya. Remember, this guy only loses to the number one, two, and three fighters in the UFC. We've seen him on his run of Lyman Good, Anthony Martin, and then Ben Askren. He just runs through everybody who is not the top three of 170 pounds. So losing a close fight with him or surviving a fight with him and not being overly threatened or hurt, that says something. Now, when Rocco Martin's on the feet, you can tell he works at Tiger Muay Thai. He's got great low calf kicks. He goes to the legs and works them a lot. He's got a full good gas tank for all 15 minutes in these three-round fights. He has great footwork. He circles well. He's got good in-and-out movement. He averages 2.69 strikes, significant strikes per minute. He does absorb 2.49 significant strikes per minute, so he has fought relatively close with his opponents. But like I've said, he's actually had a decent decently high level of competition, at least in his last little run here for the last couple of years. He's only got a 54% takedown defense, but he's very, very good on the ground. And a lot of that has come in his last couple of fights. He got taken down three times by Damian Maia, and he got taken down three times by Sergio Marias. Neither of those guys were able to do shit with it, but he did give up those takedowns. And then you rewind back a couple of years ago, back in 2017, he lost to OAM Olivier Aubameurcier, the Canadian gangsta, back before he was the broken Canadian gangster. He gave up four takedowns to him. So it's really talented, skilled wrestlers that have given him a bit of a problem, and it seems like he's adjusted his style to getting better against those kinds of guys. Now, Ramazan Amiv is not 
exactly on that level, I don't feel like. I mean, maybe he is the odds makers think he is, the market thinks that he is. He averages two takedowns per 15 minutes, so he is landing a decent number of takedowns, but he's only got a 33% takedown accuracy rate. He averages 2.51 significant strikes per minute, and he absorbs 1.4 significant strikes per minute. So he is outlanding his opponents, but let's take a look at that resume. Sam Alvey, who is one of the slowest plottingest fighters the UFC has ever seen, who he outlanded uh, 38 to 29 in a very, very slow paced fight. Then he took on Alberto Mina, who again, you may not recognize that name. It's because not really anybody recognizes that name. He, he's got a couple of UFC wins, but again, against very low level competition. And then he lost to this guy. He's only 13 and one. So I feel like we should be higher on him, but sorry, I'm not. <laughs> he lost, uh, he's got a win to, uh, Stefan Sekulik, who again is another one of these guys. He made his UFC debut and he beat him. Surprise, surprise. He outstruck him 36 to 22. So he fights a very, very low pace. Whereas Rocco Martin, I know he only averages 2.69 significant strikes per minute, but he's got a bit of a higher pace output than this guy. I actually think Rocco Martin's very live in this fight. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to take my dog approach where we're going to look to go two and two or three and three on these dogs and just hope that these prices end up paying themselves off. Because I think these lines are very incorrect, or I think people have inflated these lines to the point that it's a little bit unreasonable. I think Rocco Martin bounces back here. I don't know how high I really am on Ramazan Mamiv. I mean, he's effective, but at the UFC level, this is a big step up in competition. And this is kind of like what we talked about with Kevin Lee last week. I like to fade people in step up situations, and then I also like buy low spots on high caliber fighters. Rocco Martin was on an absolute tear. He was on a four fight win streak since his loss to OAM and he's looked very, very good. Two of those four wins coming by finish late in the third round. And then he lost to a top, top, top caliber fighter in Damian Maya, which there is no fault in that. Is Ramazan Amiv ready for the top five, the top 10? We're about to find out. And we're getting plus 140 on Rocco Martin. I will roll those dice. I think Rocco Martin is going to be able to outmove Amiv on the feet. I think he will be able to defend the takedown of Amiv. We have seen that if this thing hits the mat, he is able to scramble, he's able to reverse, he is able to sweep, and all of those things will come into play. If he can do those kinds of things against Sergio Marias and Damian Maya, he will definitely be able to do them against Ramazan Amiv. And he's only 29 years old. That's the crazy thing. I feel like Rocco has been around forever. He's only 29 years old. He's just now coming into his prime. I expect him to be improving and getting better. And Ramazan Amiv is 32. I feel like, I mean, maybe he's not the finished product, but he's probably the finished product. I'm going to roll the dice on Rocco Martin at plus 140. We're headed back up to the big boys where Candice Imbragimov is taking on Ed Short Fuse Herman. Ed Short Fuse Herman has been in the UFC for a very, very long time. He came off of the Ultimate Fighter, and that was one of the seasons way before I started betting where I just fell in love with this dude. His style, his attitude, all of it. He's just, he's a grinder, man. He is so freaking fun to watch. And he's bounced all around different divisions and weight classes and disappeared for a while and came back and had a revitalization to his career. Dude's a warrior. I love this dude. Now, Kondas Abragimov. He's kind of the new kid on the block and probably the one that we need to talk about a little bit more. He had his UFC debut in August of 2019 where he lost to Da Eun Jung in a third round submission. He is 8 and 1. He wings wild wild punches, looping wild shots, overhands, hooks. That's all he does. He just throws everything he has in these big giant swings and he leans forward and leaves his chin way open and his head straight down facing the mat when he does this he puts everything he's got into these he swarms on his opponent when he finds them hurt and he basically redlines himself he gasses himself out with every single big flurry that's what he did uh, against Dad Eun Jung, and I saw it happen in a lot of his other fights in Russia. Now, he fights out of M1 and was an undefeated 8-0, and 
against a decent level of competition. So this has just kind of worked for him up until this point. Now, he's only 24 years old, so you would expect him to kind of be getting better and things like that. But he seems like he might be an if it's not broke, don't fix it type of fighter because he's got some serious holes in his game, but he's just continued to do it. I don't know the gym that he comes out of, Sambo Pitter. It's not one that I've been able to find a whole lot of information on, and maybe the loss to Da Unjung is something that will wake him up and make him change things up a little bit, but he's just an absolute wild man. He panic wrestles when he doesn't get the takedown. He tries to throw these wild shots and then pin his opponent up against the cage, but he doesn't really have all that great takedowns. Um, he tries to pin this up, pin them up against the fence and go for the takedown. If he does get the takedown, he doesn't seem to know how to hold his opponents down. I'm not overly impressed with his wrestling. And he can actually get reversed and get pinned up against the cage himself. He doesn't seem to know how to get off the cage. He has very, very poor clinch grappling. Now, Ed Short Fuse Herman on the flip side of this thing is a good... 40 years old. He's 39 years old. And y'all know my rule. We don't bet on people that are 40 years old unless we've got a very, very good reason. He's 39, so he's just one year under that edge. He trains at ATT. He's very durable. And one thing that he does is he welcomes a firefight. He likes to slip and rip. He throws these big, heavy hooks. He is kind of slow paced. He kind of reminds me a bit of our boy Sam Alvey and he does have a really good get up day, uh, get up game. He's got a 60% takedown defense. Um, once he gets taken down, he is able to find his way back up to the feet. And I think the biggest person that gave him a problem was CB Dalloway back in 2017. He gave up six takedowns. Once it does hit the mat, he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He does work well off of his back. He does seem to gas out a decent amount. And I know that I'm saying, you know, a lot of these things and they sound a lot like flaws, but realistically... I'm going to have to take the shot on Ed Shortfuse Herman here. You can get him at plus 155 right now, and I think that's way, way too wide. Condis is a flawed, flawed young fighter, and he lost to uh, Daun Jung back in August, so it hasn't been all that long. You cannot revamp that kind of fighting style in just, what, five months? I don't think we're going to see a completely new and different version of Condis. We might see a toned down version of him. I would expect something like that. But honestly, I hope not. Because if he does any of these things, one of Ed Herman's biggest weapons is a knee straight up the middle. And Ed has put some people out with his knees. I mean, that's how he got Pat Cummins wobbled. That's how he got Tim Boach. I mean... He's hurt almost everybody else that he's been in the cage with. Now, C.B. Dalloway got popped for performance enhancing drugs, so we got to assume he may have been taking them all the way back then, and he got grounded, grinded on basically for that full fight. Gian Vellante is a bigger, more lumbering version of a guy like Ed Short Fuse Herman, so he lost a you know close three-round decision to that guy. Not overly impressive, but when you get someone with the wealth of experience that Ed has, the type of heat that a guy like Ed brings to the table, and then a guy like Condis who leaves his chin wide open for the tanking, I think that Ed's going to be able to counter basically everything that Condis does. And short of Condis landing one of these big wild winging bombs on Ed in just the right spot... I think Ed's going to be able to get the KO here. Even if he has to weather that original storm, keep it safe on the mat, recover himself, get to a second round, and then come out hammering in round two, I think he's got the opportunity to finish this thing basically all the way until the end of the fight. He's got seven KOs of his 24 wins. He's also got a six submission game. Like I said, he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He's got 13 submissions. So if he rocks this kid and it hits the ground, or if Condis gets just in too deep on a takedown, there's a chance that Short Fuse can finish him. He's an absolute finisher. And at plus 155, I like taking the stab on him. You might want to get on this one, though, because it looks like the line is moving. Over at five dimes, it's all the way down to plus 155. I'm not the only person who's seeing this opening. This is another one where we're rolling the dice. Ed's an over-the-hill fighter. We're not going to bet on him very much or very often anymore, but this is a spot where he's got a short-notice replace opponent, which, by the way, if you didn't know, this wasn't Ed's original opponent. Condis is stepping in on very short notice to take this fight. So who knows how fight ready he is. And if he has, 
you know, like I said, if he's not super fight ready for this thing, he's going to be spending the next week mostly probably focusing on his weight cut, which means not a whole lot of training specifically for Ed, and we can expect to see a lot of the same game plan and a potential gas situation. If that happens, he's going to be ripe for the picking with Ed Short Fuse Herman's big old knees and hooks. Let's roll with Short Fuse plus 155. Now we're getting towards the end of this thing. We're headed to welterweight one more time. There's a lot of welterweight fights on this card. Uh, Zalim Imadayev, 8 and 1, is taking on Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts, who is 16, 5, and 0. Oh. Zalim is 8 and 1 with 8 KOs. He has a 100% knockout rate in his wins. He's gone to the third round twice. He's gone to the second round twice. The others have all been first round knockouts. Dude throws with some serious heat. Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts is 32 years old. He is 16 and 5. And he has 7 KOs, 5 submissions, and 4 decisions. He has been knocked out three times. Three of his five losses have come by KO. The most recent one to Michelle Pereira, the guy who does all the crazy spinning back shit flip uh, type stuff that's crazy and out of a video game. He got blasted by Michelle in round one. And I mean brutally blasted in May of this year. That's one of those brain rattling knockouts that we like to talk about. Uh, he got flatlined KO by this guy and then his head hit the mat. So the back of his head slammed against the mat hard enough to knock him out again if he wasn't done already. Now back in 2017, he got KO'd stiff by Nordin Taleb in the first round. And then he went to war back in 2016 against Mike Perry and got knocked out in the third round there as well. So he's taken some pretty solid knockouts since he's been in the UFC. His three wins are over Bobby Nash, who is on a three-fight win streak, who is eight and four overall. He has a win over Oliver Inkamp, who's eight and two, and has been dropped to Bellator and won a bounce-back fight there, but he's no longer in the UFC. And then he also beat David Zawada, who we talked about earlier, who's someone we are just not impressed with. And the UFC saw his loss to Danny Roberts and was like, ah, this dude sucks. Let's use him to build other fighters. So Danny does not have a good run in the UFC. Zalim, in his last fight, he got a point deducted for blatantly grabbing the fence. Max Griffin has put together a seriously solid wrestling offensive game, and uh, he fell prey to that. He grabbed the fence, and he grabbed it bad. And he lost a point because of that in the first round. He does give up his back when he attempts to stand up, and that's something that was very, very, very apparently dangerous. But I don't think it's something that a guy like Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts is going to be able to take advantage of. He keeps his hands low, but he does throw a lot of spinning shit. He throws spinning elbows, spinning heel kicks, flying knees. He's got a good gas tank. He is durable. He does leave himself open for counters if you're going to be quick and fast enough to do it, but I don't know if a guy like Danny Hot Chocolate is. And he got frozen by Michelle. The kind of spinning, twirling stuff that Michelle was doing. Now, granted, Zalim doesn't do it to that extent, but he was absolutely scared shitless. He didn't know where anything was coming from, and he turtled up immediately. Now, Zalim outlanded Max 4.27 significant strikes versus 3.13 significant strikes over the course of their 15-minute fight. So even though he lost that decision, a lot of that had to do with the wrestling, and a lot of it had to do with the point deduction in round one for the fence grab. He outlanded Max Griffin in that fight. There's a decent chance that you could say that he probably should have won that one. You've got grounds to say that if, obviously, if he didn't do the fence grab. <laughs> so, Hot Chocolate has a 74-inch reach when compared to Zalim. Bear with me here for just one second. I apologize. I forgot to write this one down, apparently, so I've got to pull it up real quick. And I know I could edit this out, but I'll be honest, I'm using both hands and I just don't feel like it. So Hot Chocolate is six foot one. He's got a 74 inch reach. The limb is six foot oh, so he's going to be just a little bit shorter, but he's actually going to have a two inch reach advantage. He's got a 76 inch reach. The limb outputs seven. I'm sorry. He's only had the one fight in the UFC, so I already read those stats off. 4.27 significant strikes per minute versus 3.13 absorbed. He outlanded Max Griffin by over a full significant strike per minute in that fight. Now, over the course of Hot Chocolate's fights, he has landed 3.36 significant strikes per minute and absorbed 3.11. So he is ever so slightly outlanding his opponents, but not by a lot. And obviously, from what we've seen based on his run and his record... 
he's been very feast or famine. He's fought some good guys, but he's been beat by those good guys and knocked out or finished by those good guys. The low tier fighters that he's fought, he has beaten. He's knocked out a couple of them, so he does carry some power in his hands, but it just doesn't impress me. It's not enough to get it done against a higher tier opponent. I am a huge fan of Zalim in this spot. Um, he's a minus 200 favorite. If there's another favorite that you like on the card, I think he's a parlay piece. I think Zalim is just straight going to get it done against Danny Roberts. I think Danny is done after this fight. I think he gets his walking papers from the UFC. And I think this is a get right spot for a nearly undefeated fighter in Russia. They want him to ball out here. Danny, uh, is on some shit too. I tweeted out, I don't know if you guys saw that, check my Twitter. I tweeted out a picture of him. He is training with Vitor Belfort. Yes, that Vitor Belfort. And he has never looked this ripped in his entire life. I guarantee you he's on something and he will pop after this fight because he knows his back is against the wall and this is a must-win situation for him. I am going to take Zalim Imadayov, except I'm going to take him winning inside the distance at minus 110. I think that Danny is done. I think his chin is done. I think that the knockout he took from Michelle Pereira, he has not taken enough time off for that kind of a KO to recover. He's had three bad KOs in just the last couple of years at the highest level. Zalim is no joke. He's the kind of guy that can come in here and get this shit done. And he's won every single one of his fights by knockout so far. And only if you have a good solid grappling game can you pin this guy up against the fence or take him down, put him on his back to nullify that KO ability. Danny Roberts is not going to be able to do that. Danny Roberts will not be able to stand and trade with this guy, and he's going to try to because he doesn't have the wrestling pedigree that you need to stop a guy like Imadayov. Imadayov inside the distance, minus 110. All right, we have reached the co-main event. We are back up with the big boys at heavyweight, where Alexander Volkov, 37-0, and 0, is taking on Greg, the Prince of War Hardy, a short notice step in replacement for a baller fight and that big step up in competition that we have all been waiting for from Greg Hardy. Now, the last time that we saw Alexander Drago Volkov, which, by the way, a Russian with the fight name of Drago, props to you, Alexander. Good work. The last time we saw Drago was when he was losing by third round KO with one second left on the clock, cashing a bet to Derek the, ba the Black Beast Lewis in October of 2018. That's right, Derek Lewis has been a money train, and you might want to say that that's one of those fluky, crazy type of wins, but you know what? That's what Derek Lewis does. <laughs> he is live all the way until that final bell, and that's why we like to bet on him, and he got it done for me against Volkov. It was actually a pretty bad night for me. I remember it pretty clearly. I was going to pour myself a drink. Yes, fireball because I was getting eaten alive and then with one second on the clock he flatlines Volkov and gets the stoppage and that really was the opposite of UFC 244 it was the end of night resurrection where my last two or three uh, bets ended up going for me instead of against me and I felt pretty damn good after that one plus who doesn't love a knockout comeback in MMA it's beautiful <laughs> so Volkov is a very strange case in my opinion. So he's been in the UFC since 2016. Uh, he went to decision against Timothy Johnson and Roy Nelson. And then he TKO'd Stefan Struve, which, big whoop. You know, we all know Stefan Struve at this point. Um, then he TKO's Fabricio Verdum in 2018, which that really turned everybody's heads because Verdum was very recently the strap holder at heavyweight, and we expected a much better fight out of him, but it didn't quite happen that way. He didn't seem like himself. Um, he kind of folded on himself. It, it wasn't a good fight by Fabricio for Doom, and it's one of those ones where at this stage of the game, full hindsight, I'm wondering, was that Alexander or was that Verdum being shot? And I, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question. So it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not sure if Volkov is as good as we think he might have been. And then also the fight with Derek Lewis. He was relatively dominant in that fight for the full 15 minutes until that final second where he gave up the big shot. But he didn't do a whole lot. He strikes well at range. He has decent hands. He's got a good uppercut and he kicks well from distance. But he slows down, and he slows down really quickly. It's like in the first round, he looks 
like a middleweight. He's got a lot of energy. He's light on his feet. He outmoves you. And then about two minutes into the fight, he immediately dips off. And I know that's a heavyweight thing, but he's built like a middleweight. He's He's got the... He doesn't look like a heavyweight. He's not carrying a whole bunch of extra weight around. He's very well put together. You wouldn't think he's as big as he is. And he's a smaller heavyweight as far as he doesn't hit that 265 pound limit. He sits right around 240, 250 pounds, that kind of thing. So Greg Hardy is going to be kind of a 2.0 version of the Black Beast here in this spot. He's just a little bit bigger than Derek Lewis, both physically and weight wise. And he's more athletic than Derek Lewis is. And we saw the troubles that Lewis gave a guy like Volkov. I think that's a very, very telling fight was Volkov's last fight against Derek Lewis. Greg Hardy is a younger, faster, stronger, more athletic version of Derek Lewis. I mean, I don't know if he's got that crazy beast strength where he can just push somebody off of him. We haven't seen him up against a grappler that's got him in some serious situations yet where he'd have to use that kind of an escape. But part of me kind of senses that it might be there. Now, Volkov is willing to get into a bit of a firefight. When he gets hit and hurt, he wants to get it back. He bites down on his mouthpiece and he swings. That is not something that you want to do against a guy like Greg Hardy. We've seen the type of power that Greg Hardy brings to the table. And Volkov, he didn't take a whole lot of shots from Derek Lewis. And it was only one shot that got it done. So he outlanded Lewis 121 to 39 in their fight. And that one out of 39 shots is what did him in at the end of the fight. He fought uh, Fabricio Verdum perfectly even 48 to 48 on the uh, the strikes. And then he outstruck Stefan Struve 135 to 41. He outstruck Roy Nelson 122 to 32. And then he fought relatively even with Timothy Johnson at 45 and 35. So Guys where he's got a serious advantage on, like Stefan Struve, who we know was broken, Roy Nelson, who was 40 years old and had a gigantic reach disadvantage, he's able to just completely outclass on those guys. And a guy like Derek Lewis, who, as we know, fights a very slow pace and is willing to sit back and wait for his one big shot. He outclasses those guys. Now, Greg Hardy is still a bit of an anomaly. We don't know exactly what we're dealing with at this point, but he has been showing steady, steady improvements. And in his last fight, even though he got <laughs> DQ'd for the inhaler gate, <laughs> he completely wrecked Ben Sassoli. I mean, he he was crushing him 54 to 26. He took a more measured approach to the fight, and he was picking his shots a whole lot better. Now, if he's making those kinds of improvements, then a guy like, Alexander Yakovlev, who fights down to his opponent's speed in some cases, they'll probably trade relatively even shots. He's not going to be able to tee off on Hardy the way that he did against the Black Beast because he knew he could get away from the Black Beast and he knew the Black Beast doesn't have a high output, whereas Greg Hardy, on the other hand, will maybe be able to go toe-to-toe with him on that. Now, obviously, he doesn't have the kind of output that Volkov has, but he has more output, I think, than Greg Hardy has. I'm sorry, than Derek Lewis has. He averages 5.73 significant strikes per minute. And I know he's been fighting cans, but he's outlanded his opponents. They only land on him 1.8 significant strikes per minute. Volkov averages 5.31 significant strikes per minute. That's against a much higher level of competition, and he absorbs 2.39 significant strikes per minute. He has a 75 takedown defense and 75% takedown accuracy rating, does Volkov. So... Uh, you tell me. <laughs> this is uh, this is a bit of a crazy fight. I mean, money has come in on Hardy. I'll just start off by telling you that. They opened this line way wide. I want to say I saw Greg Hardy up at like plus 260 right when the line first dropped. Now, it was a look ahead line. So, it was, you know, a long time ago that they opened that up. I'm looking over at uh, best fight odds and it looks like it actually opened up at plus 150. And then he got bet up into the plus 200s. He peaked up around that plus 250, plus 260 area. And since then, money has come back on Greg Hardy, dropping him down to where he is now, and he's about plus 200. I really was planning on coming here and telling you that I'm going to bet Greg Hardy. I can't. I just can't. This is the spot that we have all been waiting for. This is the moment where he takes a slight step up in competition and fights a legitimate mixed martial artist, not a can, not somebody who's handpicked for him. He's a late notice replacement. He's flying all the way to Russia. We saw how badly he gassed out in his last fight, which is the first time that he has gone 15 minutes. 
And he's fighting a guy like Volkov who is going to have a couple of advantages on him and namely a gigantic experience advantage on him, which most of his other fights he has not had the experience advantage on. So lots of questions, lots and lots of questions surrounding this fight. Unfortunately, the totals are not out at this point, so I can't give you a whole lot of information there. I might look to bet it over in this spot. Keep an eye on my Twitter because there's a couple of things I may pull the trigger on before this thing happens. Um, Volkov is a minus 265 favorite. You can get him plus 100 inside the distance if you think he's going to put Greg Hardy out. Now, Greg Hardy's got a brick head. I don't know that he's going to put him out. Now, Volkov by three round decision at plus 285, I think holds some serious value. You're essentially flipping the line. You're getting a bigger dog line than the current favorite line on Volkov if you think that Greg Hardy can just last for 15 minutes. And I think if this fight looks exactly like the Derek Lewis fight did, that's more than likely the way that it's going to go. Because if Volkov is a little gun shy based on what happened with the Lewis fight, he will stay at range. He will pick and poke at Greg Hardy. He won't let himself get into the slugfest that he, you know, kind of let himself get into there in the last couple of seconds against Derek Lewis. And then he'd scrape away with the decision at plus 285. I think that's entirely possible. Now, Greg Hardy landing a big shot. We saw it work with Derek Lewis, so that's entirely possible as well. And I think Greg Hardy might theoretically be a better striker than Derek Lewis. So there's there's a lot of factors at play here. I think if we get a decent number on like a one and a half and over under one and a half, because Greg Hardy's fights, they don't go that long. His most recent fight was the first one to go three rounds. He had a second rounder against Alan Crowder, but... All of his other fights have been first round finishes. So if the bookie's dumb enough to give me a one and a half, I will be betting the over on that. I'll tell you that now. Very, very tempted to take the Volkov by three rounds at plus 285, but we're going to put a pin in it. I will come back to that one and let you know if I want to make a move on it, but we're going to hold off for now. We did it. We're here. We hit that main event where we've got Zabit Magomed Dishripov, 17 and one, taking on Calvin Cater who is 23 and 0 and this is a fantastic fight. It's a good fight for a free card especially. It's not one that you would pay for to see, but all in all, I actually think this is a pretty solid overall card. Um, the main and the co-main event are going to be fun fights and very very interesting fights for the futures of both of those divisions and there's a couple of relatively interesting fights on the card below it as well. I mean, there's some garbage mixed in there, but all in all, I'm pretty excited, I'm pretty hyped about this fight. So the beat is supposedly the next big thing at 145. 17 and 1. He's on a hell of a run right now. Um and it just everyone on the planet thinks the world of him. He's elusive. He uses leg kicks very well. He fights long. He's very long and rangy. He uses that well to his advantage. He throws lots of spinning stuff, back fists uh, mostly. He has excellent footwork. He fights well moving forward and moving backwards. And when it hits the ground, he has excellent wrestling, good submission attacks. He floats when he's on top, so he switches position without letting his opponent get out of the situations. And he has good submission attacks from both top position and when he gets his opponent's back. Calvin Cater on the flip side of this thing uh, is 31 years old and he has some serious power. Nine of his 20 wins have come by KO. He does have eight decisions and three submissions. He's very, very durable. He defends well. He parries well. He's very calm under fire when he does take shots and his opponents are kind of coming at him. um, He doesn't panic. He lets it roll off pretty, pretty well. Um, One of the things I like to see was in his fight against Chris Fishgold back in October, he let Fishgold unload on him, stayed comfortable, and then calmly picked his kill shot. He was very much on the defensive for the first three minutes of that fight. It was only a one-round fight, but for the first three minutes, he let Fishgold kind of do what he wanted to do, just kind of picked and poked and prodded, and then he found the shot that worked and Boom, it was over. As soon as he decided he wanted to use the kill shot, it was done. Now, looking at his Instagram, he is in absolutely the best shape of his career. He is ready to come in here to Russia, and he is ready to play spoiler. He fought Hinato Moicano back in April of 2018, and that is his lone UFC loss. That was also only his third UFC fight. Very similar to this one, a clash of young up-and-coming potential contenders. 
and he hurt Moicano in that fight. Um, he's very, very intelligent. He brings a very smart approach to the game, which I love seeing. And one thing that he does very, very well is he backs off when he needs to. So when he's got his opponents hurt, he's got a kill streak in him. Like, he, he has some serious killer instinct, but he can back off and let it go exactly when he needs to, which I love to see because he stays out of damage and he doesn't engage in a firefight where he can be the one essentially that gets clipped and hurt. So Zabit is six foot one with a 73 inch reach. He averages 4.53 significant strikes per minute. He only absorbs 2.44. So he is massively outstriking his opponents and he has a decently high paced output. He lands 6.23 takedowns per 15 minutes. So he lands a whole lot of takedowns and he's got a very impressive 59% takedown accuracy on that. So he's taking his opponents down a lot and essentially at will. Calvin Cater is 5'11", he's got a 72 inch reach, so he's uh, even though he's going to be a couple inches shorter, he's only going to have a one reach disadvantage, which is something Zabit hasn't had, oh, pardon me, hasn't had to deal with a whole lot in the UFC, most of the people he fights he's got a significant reach advantage over. Calvin Cater outputs 5.06 significant strikes per minute. Now, he absorbs 6.35 significant strikes per minute, but a lot of that is due to his take one to give one style, and like I said, he fought guys like Chris Fishgold where he definitely let them have a minute in the fight so he could find his shot and call it a day. So he let Fishgold massively outstrike him before he decided to turn the tables. He also fought a guy like uh, Ricardo Lamas who's got output, Shane Burgos who he KO'd in the third round. He fought Andre Feely, went full 15 minutes with him. I mean, he's had a very stiff level of competition and he's basically fought only up and comers and guys who could be clarified as the or classified as the next big thing since he got into the UFC. Ricardo Lamas, arguably speaking, is the only guy on that list that's an established, you know, not next generation killer type of fighter. And I can poke holes in Zabit's resume. A lot of people may not want to hear this, but I can. <laughs> so he got into the UFC in 2017 and he fought Mike Santiago. That's right. Mike Santiago, who is 21 and 12, he went on a three fight losing skid in the UFC and has since been dropped off of the UFC. He's no longer in the UFC. He then fought Shamon Marias. Now, I am high on Shamon Marias. I like Shamon Marias. He's a good fighter, and the UFC has dropped him, but he was on a two fight losing streak. Um, he went two and three in the UFC and has since been dropped. I think that was a mistake. I didn't want to see him dropped, but. Maybe he wasn't as good as I might have thought he was because he didn't fare super well in the UFC and only won against low-level competition. He has a win, a decision win over Kyle Bokniak, who's 8-5, and five, currently riding a three-fight win streak, and may no longer have his job in the UFC either. He did submit Brandon Davis, albeit with a crazy insane knee bar that no one expected to happen. And Davis, as much as I think has all the skills in the world, is that bad fight IQ guy that we will not ever bet on again. And he's 1-4 in, in his last five in the UFC. And I'd be surprised if he still has his job after his next fight also. His last win was his most impressive win. Kind of a lot like Cater's against Lamas where he fought Jeremy Little Heath and Stevens. Now, Jeremy Stevens, as much as that was the best, biggest step up in competition that he has, is 1-3-1 and one in his last five. He lost by KO to Jose Aldo, and then he lost to Zabit, he lost to Yair, and then he had the no contest eye poke against Yair. Now granted, those are all very high level opponents, very top tier opponents. Yair, maybe a title challenger, Jose Aldo, former champion, Zabit, maybe the next big thing. But before that, he landed a big shot on Josh Emmett, which nobody saw coming. He derailed the hype train that was Duho Choi, and then he fought a 15-minute decision against Gilbert Melendez. I know the last time I broke down the fight with Yair Rodriguez, I was relatively high on Jeremy Stevens, but you kind of look back after everything and realize where you went wrong on things, and I think I may have had a little bit wrong on Jeremy Stevens. I still hold him in high regard. I'm a fan. He's got a good skill set. He's dangerous, uh, but really, he's the only legitimate UFC-level fighter, I think, that Zabit has fought, whereas Calvin Cater has fought almost all legitimate UFC level fighters and he gave Hinato Moicano a hell of a fight not only that like I said per his Instagram he is absolutely 
in the best shape of his life. This is the one fight, the one pick that I tweeted out earlier in the week because I wanted to make sure I got the line. I'm taking Calvin Cater. I'm going to roll the dice on the dog here at plus 225. He's ready to storm into Russia. He's ready to play spoiler. And at that price tag, I think we've got the right price. He also sports, what did I say, an 80% takedown defense rating. So even though I expect the beat is probably going to get him down at some time, he is no stranger to the mat. He is solid at what he does when this thing hits the floor. He's going to be able to get back to the feet. And if this is a 15-rounder main event, by the way, if you haven't heard just yet, this is not a five-rounder main event. That does favor Zabit, I will not lie to you, but Calvin Cater knows how to work his way around a 15-minute fight as well. It's not like he's a fish out of water over 15 minutes, and he does have a couple of first-round KOs to his name as well. He has several three-round decisions, actually a lot of three-round decisions on his record. He knows what he's doing, and he even TKO'd a guy like Shane Burgos in the third round. So if Zabit slows down, and one One thing I saw in the Jeremy Stevens fight, which this is another one where I feel like the last fight is super telling for the next fight. Zabit struggled with the countering and with the power of Jeremy Stevens. And let me tell you, I am absolutely being 1000% truthful when I say that Calvin Cater is better than Jeremy Stevens. And he has the exact same skill set, the exact same ability, just better. I think Calvin Cater is live here. He might not win. But plus 225 on this caliber of a fighter is ridiculous. If you wanted to give him around plus 140, plus 130, something like that, I'd have to pass. Maybe I'd take a poke on Zabit or something like that. But I think Calvin is live to win this thing outright, and anything over plus 200 is criminal. Now, I know I said I was going to take it easy and I didn't have a lot to say, but y'all know me. I love my MMA and I get excited. Sorry, this one was so long or not. Sorry, you're welcome. This one was so long. Let's recap those picks. We are running with the dogs this week in Russia. We're looking for some upsets. We've got Dalucha champion Lou Giambula at plus 310 for a big cash. We're going to hope Anthony Rocco Martin gets it done at plus 140. We're going to rely on the power and the anger of Ed Short Fuse Herman at plus 155. We will take Zalim Imadayev inside the distance at minus 110 to make an example of Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts. And then we'll look for the upset in the main event where Calvin Cater is a plus 225 underdog thank you all for sticking with me like this thing share subscribe get the word out about the die hard mma podcast i love you all positive vibes good luck on your bets college basketball is around so i know y'all are be going crazy let's try and make some cash at ufc russia this weekend give me a follow at die hard mma podcast and let's roll